very warm welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation. Welcome to you wherever you might be in the UK or wherever you might be around the world. This evening, our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest, Roger Morehouse, and I'll introduce uh, our guest in just a moment after some brief housekeeping. Um, please do ask questions. This is possible by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility on your screen. We'll do our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. You'll also notice you have a chat facility and this will allow you to send a message to the other participants on this webinar should you wish to do so. Finally, we are recording this event and you'll find it along with other past events uh, at our website, millim.org.uk. It'll be posted in the next day or so. Uh, there you can also book tickets for our future events and details of our future programme uh, can be found there too. Now to our guest, Roger Morehouse is a historian specialising in modern German and Polish history. He's a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Warsaw, and he's the author of several books. One of his earlier publications, First to Flight, the Polish War 1939, resulted in him being awarded the Polish Foreign Ministry's History Prize in 2019. More recently, he's published this book, The Forgers, The Forgotten Story of the Holocaust's Most Audacious Rescue Operation, which is very kindly uh, agreed to speak to us about tonight. So without further ado, Roger, a very warm Milim welcome to you and over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in, as it were, this evening. Um, uh, great pleasure to be with you and, and to tell you this um, remarkable story of, uh, of the Wadosh group and, uh, as I call them, the Forgers. Um, I was just speaking earlier on, just a moment ago, with my two moderators there, and uh, we, we were um, mentioning, you mentioned that uh, you have had um, Danny Finkelstein on, talking about his book, um, Hitler, Stalin, Mum and Dad. Brilliant book, by the way. Um, as I'm, I'm sure you've all, all read it. If you haven't, you must. Um, uh, and it's in interesting, as a, by way of a sort of start, that um, um, that was... Uh, the one of the key elements of his narrative in that book was that his uh, mother's family, the, um, the the Wiener family, um, had actually survived on a Paraguayan passport issued by the Wadosh Group. Um, now, interestingly, Danny hadn't known about that um, when I spoke to him, which must have been, it was just before COVID. It must have been of January, February of 2020. So now four years ago, um, and I got in touch with him because I saw the the, the files where his family were mentioned, um, and he had mentioned online that there had been a sort of Paraguayan connection, that there had been this mysterious Paraguayan passport, um, and uh, this was somebody alerted me to that particular tweet that he had sent out, and I contacted him and we had coffee, uh, and I filled in all of the gaps as to where that Paraguayan passport had come from. Um, Danny Finkelstein being a journalist um, primarily and myself being a historian uh, he then subsequently beat me to the uh, to the to the draw in terms of publishing and his book containing that, that information uh, came out about two months before mine uh, frustratingly so he sort of uh, you know gathered gathered the plaudits as it were but you know all good it's a fantastic book um, there's much more in it than just that. Uh, so, you know, I think we're all we're both endeavouring, I think, to spread the word of uh, of this remarkable story. So that's that's my uh, uh, my goal this evening as well. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Owen? There we are. So this is just a, a brief kind of introduction to the book rather shameless on my part for which i apologize but you know my wife wouldn't forgive me if i didn't try and uh, you know flog a few books on the on the back of uh, events like this um just to give a uh, you know show you the cover um and a couple of sort of favorable quotes from uh, various august uh, publications the times jewish chronicle and so on um uh, and bits of commentary it is it is rare i must say it's quite rare i think to find 
genuinely new aspects to you know rather familiar and and well trodden stories you know like the holocaust or you know wider world war ii stories i think it is still quite unusual to find um genuinely new stuff which is significant i mean you can always find something that's that's new but not significant but in this case i think this is a significant story um i didn't discover it i should add it was discovered in 2016 um and was sort of it came to me in a series of emails in 2018 i think from a friend of mine in poland who basically said you know what do you think of this um, and I read read up the material that had been published on it, which wasn't much, and said this sounds fantastic, um, because to my mind it sort of illustrated um, that rare thing. It was it was uh, a a new take or a new aspect to a familiar story. Um, it was also a relatively uplifting story, um, at sort of aspect of the Holocaust story, which as as we all know is not known for its sort of positive uh, positive chapters. So, you know, there is the sort of rather uplifting element here of of people at least trying to do the right thing in those extremely difficult circumstances, um, even if they are to a large extent stymied by, you know, their their rivals and their opponents. And in many cases, by the people that should really have been helping them, which is one strand of the story. Um, so it is it is a remarkable story. It's very new. Uh, and I hope you find it of interest. Uh, next slide, please, Anne. So I start the story with this chap. This is Heinz Lichtenstern. Uh, and he was a, a German Jew who had um, emigrated um, in the early 90s or mid 1930s to uh, to Holland, rather like uh, Anne Frank's family had done the same thing. Um, and he had done his best to uh, sort of insulate himself and his family from this sort of coming conflagration, as it were. So he, you know, he'd um, uh, uh, passed over most of his property and his and his business over to a a non-Jewish friend, uh, at least nominally, um, so that he could try and escape the sort of enforced confiscations that were coming after the, uh, the German occupation of Holland. Um, he'd also then sourced a number of, you know, false identity documents and so on um, for, for both for himself and his family. Um, it didn't save them initially. They were deported in the... Uh, initially in the summer of 1943 uh, and the family him both himself and his wife and two children you can see them actually in the uh, on the, the the document on the right hand side which is the the Paraguayan passport I say that in inverted commas but that's the Paraguayan passport that ultimately saved them um, they ended up in Theresienstadt um, unusually actually because most holders of these passports which I'll, I'll go into sort of how it worked on the German side a little bit later on but most of the holders of these passports ended up actually in Belsen, of all places, um, because Belsen was a sort of hybrid camp. And that's what was earmarked for um, a, a, as a sort of holding camp for the exchange Jews. But Liechtenstein, for reasons that I haven't yet divined, uh, ended up in Theresienstadt. And in the autumn of 1944, so comparatively late in the war, um, he was rounded up and he was scheduled for deportation and he was told that he was being sent to the Reich for labour service along with uh, or as part of a group of 2,500 uh, Jewish males. Um, at the time, of course, the official narrative was just that. It wasn't that they were going to Auschwitz. It was that they were being sent for labour to the Reich. Um, but most of those present in Theresienstadt knew pretty well that being deported out of there wasn't good news. Um, the sort of Bush Telegraph was, you know, was had reasonably well planted the idea that, uh, you know, deportation out of there was not a good thing. Um, so he apparently, uh, went, when he received his notice of deportation, he went back to his, um, um, to the, the room where his uh, wife and family were, um, hugged his children and and simply lay on the bed and cried so so his daughter says um it was the first time incidentally she'd ever seen him cry he was a very sort of robust man and and had done everything he could to save them and i think the realization at that moment was that if he went um then he would no longer be able to save them either um so this was a, a, a as you can imagine quite a climactic moment um 
a day later, he was out on the what was known as the Schleuser, which was the sort of Appellplatz of uh, of Theresienstadt, um, being sort of processed for deportation, as they tended to do, um, which was a very messy process. You know, there's lots of sort of baggage and and mess around the place, and um, uh, it, various many desperate individuals wondering what's going to become of them. Um, and he seems to have had the idea at that point of trying, you know, in desperation of trying to play this card. He had this Paraguayan passport, which he'd sourced previously when he was still in Holland. Um, and it, as I said, it hadn't saved him from deportation um, out of Holland initially and then later to Theresienstadt. So I suppose he must have wondered, well, it's not going to save me now. But in desperation, he thought he may as well give it a try. So he approached one of the guards and presented this passport. And said, you know, essentially, I've got this. What what do you want to do about it? And he was passed up the line to various superiors. And eventually he was given a small slip of paper which had the word Ausgeschieden on it. So, you know, sort of selected out, we could say. Uh, and he was sent back to his barrack block. Um, and as it was, that deportation um, uh, transport left Theresienstadt the following day with 2,499 Jewish males on it, uh, rather than the 2,500, because Heinz Lichtenstein was missing. Um, as I think we can all imagine, they didn't go, go of course, to labour service in the Reich. They went straight to Auschwitz, where the majority of that transport, probably about 70 percent, were murdered on arrival. Heinz Lichtenstein, of course, avoided that fate. So both he and, by extension, his wife and two children survived the day survived Theresienstadt to liberation uh, in, the, in the early summer of 1945 um, and subsequently uh, emigrated, uh, made a new life in the, in the uh, United States and uh, their, their story uh, ends with a, uh, a happy ending. So it's quite a remarkable one that it, even he didn't seem to have faith that this peculiar sort of rather rather messy handwritten passport which, which is what you can see on the right hand side with very distinctive handwriting and various stamps subsequently those stamps incidentally are from after the war he still used that passport post-war initially until he had sort of had regulated his affairs and had uh, got hold of a new passport to replace it um, but this passport saved his life and we have to ask how that happened because that's the that's the sort of key to the story um, next slide, please, Alan. So that, that passport had been produced by a group of diplomats and uh, uh, Jewish activists in uh, wartime Switzerland, in the, in the, the Swiss capital of Bern, um, known colloquially as often known as the Bern Group or the Wadosh Group, named after their uh, leader, as it were, the, the most senior member there, who was Alexander Wadosh, who you can see top left. Um, and he was the uh, representative of the Polish government in exile in Switzerland. He was a Polish diplomat. Um, he had worked as a journalist in the interwar period, had been a, a junior diplomat prior to that, had fallen foul of the, um, the Second Republic, the government of the Second Republic under uh, Pilsudski. Um, and had become a journalist and then was restored to diplomatic service um, in 1939-1940. And he arrived in Bern uh, in April 1940. Um, with him, he had uh, his two uh, deputies, Stepan Rinievich, who is uh, bottom left, and Konstanty Rokitsky. So all three were Polish diplomats. Uh, and center at the bottom is Julius Kuhl. Uh, who was a Polish-Jewish or Polish-Jewish origin, um, but had been living in Switzerland for um, since the late 1920s. And he served as a, a sort of, he was a, a attaché at the, uh, the embassy, but he served as a crucial liaison between the three diplomats and the two uh, Jewish activists who were, as you can see on the right-hand side, Abraham Silberschein, uh, who was the, uh, the founder and the local representative of uh, a Jewish relief organization called, called Relico, and Chaim Eis, bottom right, uh, who was the, uh, again, one of the founders and the representative in Switzerland of Agudat Israel, which was a well-known um, Orthodox uh, aid agency. Now, between them, they very 
organically, it must be said, they hatched a plan which really crystallised in, one has to say, 1941, so really quite late, um, to produce Latin American passports so as to try to assist initially Polish Jews to, to uh, not necessarily escape from Poland, but certainly to escape the Holocaust. And they drew on an example which had already been um, uh, given by a Japanese envoy in Lithuania, of all places. This gets a bit complicated. I'll try and simplify it as well as I can, uh, but do bear with me. Um, Kiyune Sugihara, which is quite a well-known story now, so some of you might be familiar with it. Um, he had been the Japanese envoy in Kaunas in Lithuania uh, in 1939, 1940. And in the autumn of 1940, as the situation in Lithuania sharpened somewhat with the with the occupation by the Soviets um, and lots of uh, Jewish Lithuanian Jews and also Polish Jews who had escaped northward into Lithuania following the destruction of Poland the year before um, were sort of knocking on the door of any diplomatic institution possible to try and get papers to get out uh, and Sugihara was very keen to assist it as the best he could, even though he'd been told not to by the government in Tokyo, by his superiors. Um, and he started issuing really quite liberally um, Japanese transit visas. And this, of course, meant that if you had a Japanese transit visa, because of the peculiarities of the Soviet system, you could then apply for a transit visa across the Soviet Union itself and for an exit visa from the Soviet Union. So this was a crucial document um, and in, con in Congress with a, 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 um, a fellow diplomat, a Dutch representative in the, in the region who gave them um, a visa to the, their, end, their end destination, which was strangely was Curacao. So between the three of them or between those two and then the, the Soviet system, you had the, the you negotiated a lot of the bureaucratic maze which allowed you to actually escape the Soviet Union. Um, particularly as a sort of stateless um, ex-Polish Jew. So he had, is thought to have saved something like two and a half thousand Jews um, in this way. Um, and this operation, because it dealt primarily with Polish or ex-Polish citizens, was actually quite well known to the Polish government in exile in London. Um, he also had a couple of members of um, Polish military intelligence on his staff, um, working in a sort of quid pro quo basis. So someone like Alexander Wadosh in Bern in 1940 would have been quite aware of, of what uh, uh, Sugihara had been doing. Um, so there was, and actually, actually I should add that the first passport that Wadosh issued was actually given to somebody who was in the Soviet zone of occupation of Poland, who was told to go north to Kaunas and follow the same route that Sugihara was was using himself. So it's pretty clear from that that they knew what Sugihara was doing and they were willing to sort of copy it to some extent. Um, crucially, in their in their sort of iteration of this, this uh, passport scheme, the Wadosh group used a, uh, a local honorary consul in Switzerland whose name was Rudolf Hoogley. Um, I would love to have a photograph of Rudolf Hoogley, but I, I, despite all my efforts, I have not yet discovered one. So he remains in the shadow. Um, he was a local, um, had been a diplomat, had been uh, a, a, a businessman. And in his retirement, he had taken on the role of honorary consul for the state of Paraguay. Now, Paraguay was um, too small in 1939-40 to have its own representation in somewhere like Switzerland. It didn't see that there was much point. There weren't many Paraguayan citizens that needed to be dealt with, needed to be helped. So it worked in Switzerland, at least, through honorary consuls, and he was one of them. Um, and in that capacity, he had the ability, uh, legally at least, and, and practically in terms of the, you know, the hardware to do it, he had the ability to issue passports. Um, so what the Wadosh group did was they approached Hoogley, and he was quite reasonably well known. Um, he had been well known after the Anschluss in uh, 1938, for um, responding quite favourably to the uh, to the entreaties of uh, various fugitive Jews who were trying to escape from from Austria, they already had that as you uh, as you might say on his on his CV. 
So the uh, Wados group approached him and said, well, you know, obviously we will pay and uh, can we have, you know, a supply of these passports? And Hughley, of course, obliged. Um, at huge cost, it must be said, Hughley was charging, it was sort of a sliding scale and a little bit, as far as uh, we can tell, um, uh, variations by uh, by demand, but he tended to charge up to 2,000 Swiss francs per passport, which is a huge amount of money um, in 1940. It's a lot of money now, uh, for those of you that know the um, exchange rate, but it's an awful lot of money in, um, in 1940. Um, so with this sort of network, which gradually develops, you have the two representatives of the Jewish agency, Silverschein and, and Chaim Eis, on the right hand side there, who have all of these contacts into Poland, into the Jewish centers in Poland, into the into the ghettos. Um, they are the sort of go to people and people tend to tend to write them letters, say, you know, do anything you can to get us out. We need to get our families out, whatever. So if you imagine those that are in the ghettos in, in occupied um Poland in 41 and into 42 perhaps are desperate to get out and very often are writing letters to anyone that they think will listen and might possibly be able to help them and some of those letters ended up on the desks of Abraham Silberschein and Karl Ice simple as that they wrote letters everywhere else as well they wrote letters to Istanbul to Stockholm and to anyone else they thought would listen um, but in this case, they actually got lucky and um, and uh, uh, landed on the right the right desks. Um, so those two would sort of essentially vet the applicants that they received. Um, there was a sort of it sounds a bit cruel, but there was a sort of vetting process going on. But certainly by the end of this forty two and into forty three, um, they are aware at that stage that this is really an exterminatory threat they are facing and for those like abraham silberschein and chaim ice they're they're very keen really to try and really in a in a quite one has to say rather br brutally realistic way um they're really keen to try and preserve something of the jewish nation which means effectively um uh you know um preserving those or, or enabling those to survive that they perceived as being most important so for Chaim Ice, this was very often religious scholars and rabbis. And for Abraham Silberstein, who was much more um, sort of assimilated in, in, in his mindset and, and his behavior and so on, it was writers, journalists, painters, you know, whoever else might, might be a, 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 of use. So there's really a sort of a feeling of, of trying to preserve those that might sort of serve, um, you know, the Jewish people sort of going forward, as it were. Um, so there is there is a, a vetting procedure that goes on. They pass those lists on um, via Julius Kuhl to the uh, diplomats who then arrange with Rudolf Hugli, the Honorary Consul of Paraguay, arrange for the passports to be made. And your application is it, an interesting thing, the application in inverted commas, the letter that would come from um, a ghetto in occupied Poland would have to be written in code for one thing. Um, and it would, it would or very often it would say, um, you know, uh, you know, please, re please remember me to Aunt So and So. It's making it out, making it out as though it's sort of a a, a family letter, um, very innocuous. Uh, please remember me to Aunt So and So. Very often, they would also use um, Hebrew code on the basis, understandably, that that the German censors wouldn't be able to understand Hebrew, which the vast majority of them didn't. Um, and then they would they would often include a photograph because you need a photograph for the passport. So you say, you know, I send a I send a recent photograph to remind our aunt so and so of how I look now or my new hairdo or whatever it might be. Um, so it's very there were lots of sort of coded methods by which you could get the necessary information across, you know, date of birth and so on um, and and send the, the most recent passport in. So that's a very interesting angle on the um, on the whole question, and it's something I go on, go into in some depth in the book as to how that code tended to develop, uh, and you know how very often it was also misunderstood or misconstrued as well. Um, it's quite an interesting angle to the story. So that's essentially how it worked. But they put these um, uh, applications, as it were, together. Be sent to Switzerland. They would be vetted, and then the the, the successful names again it sounds very cruel would be passed on to the diplomats to arrange the passports. The passports themselves then stamped and signed and really produced in the, in the normal way, 
which is why the, the forgers is a little bit of a misnomer um, because they weren't forging. They were actually sort of illegally producing, but but they were produced in the normal way. Um, the, the end result, those passports would then most in most cases, they sometimes use couriers, particularly when they were using uh, with the, the, the Dutch underground. But in most cases, they were sent by post, believe it or not. So the postal system still worked to some extent, subject to lots of looting by by German government officials and others. Um, but the postal system actually worked to some extent, even within even within the ghettos of occupied Poland. Um, so in vast majority of cases, those passports were um, sent by post back into um, occupied Poland. Um, and then, of course, the individual themselves had the chance, as Heinz Lichtenstein did, to sort of wave that passport and say, you know, essentially, you can't do this to me. Uh, I'm a Paraguayan citizen. Um, even though the Germans kind of knew, uh, certainly by the time that the, we, we get into 1943, they kind of know that this is a rather spurious operation and that, you know, if they're presented with a passport by a, you know, a very orthodox um, Jewish gentleman in, in let's say, the Warsaw, Warsaw Ghetto, um, who doesn't speak any Spanish and probably couldn't find Paraguay on a map, um, they're going to be pretty doubtful as to whether he's actually Paraguayan. But the key thing is that they didn't care. And we'll go into that in a minute. Um, next slide, Alan, please. So, sorry, one back. That's it. So there's another example in the center of that is another example of one of those passports that they produced. Looks the same. You can see the same curious sort of um, italic handwriting, which is actually the, the handwriting of, uh, of Konstanty Rokitsky, who's one of those diplomatic uh, uh, members that I just mentioned. You can see at the bottom the signature of Rudolf Hoogli. Uh, the, uh, the the passport in the centre. So that's the um, that's the Paraguayan honorary consul in Switzerland. Um, and just incidentally, on the left is um, a another document which is known as a promesa. And these were produced rather later when it, it was you know the sheer number of people applying again using that word applying for these passports was so great. Uh, and many of them didn't have access to photographs and so on. So they just used to write letters in. So this was considered a sort of cheaper alternative, which was basically for Hoogly. And there were others that did similar things um, to write a letter saying essentially that this is the, the bearer of this letter um, is recognized as a citizen of Paraguay um, and essentially saying that the paperwork is is in is in progress. So the, the necessary paperwork, i.e. the passport, is in progress. And this was um, in many cases was also enough um, to essentially pull those uh, the recipients out of the you know the deportation lines out of the the line for the death camp and into to put it crudely into the line for the concentration camps so that's essentially how it worked uh, as you can see on the right hand side by the time that this operation was shut down and it was shut down um uh through um 1943 essentially by combination of the the swiss police um with the gestapo at their back um you know essentially pulling in the the six members that i've just mentioned for always for interrogation trying to intimidate them uh and then subsequently going after the the honorary consuls they went after hoogley and they went after a couple of others who were involved as well so they went after the honorary consuls that was the source of the passports and that's how it was shut down but before so in January 44, for example, um, Abraham Silberschein compiled uh, a report on their on their activities, which by then had shut down. And he estimated that they had supplied passports to 10,000 recipients, um, which does make this one of the largest rescue operations of the Holocaust at all. Um, they had supplied passports, as it says there, to um, citizens of 15 countries. Predominantly Poles, something like 70% of the recipients were Polish Jews. Uh, most of the remainder were either German or, by extension, Dutch Jews. And many of them were, like the Franks and like the Liechtensteins, were German Jews who had previously emigrated to Holland and then subsequently. So it depends whether you class them as Dutch Jews or German Jews. Um, but 15 countries in total, although the majority come from those three countries, 
Uh, and crucially, from a German perspective, they were reclassified as what they called exchange Jews, Austausch Juden. Um, and the logic here was quite, again, it's brutally simple. The logic was that the German Nazi regime realized that there were lots of uh, German nationals held abroad, particularly in America, um, as enemy uh, enemy aliens, effectively, and those people were useful to the German war effort. They were certainly useful as bloodstock, and let's not forget, as we well know, that um, the Nazi project is a racial one. It's obsessed with blood. Um, so, you know, getting back what it would see as good blood, i.e. those who are qualified and sort of racially pure and all the rest of it, uh, was, a, was a very important thing for them to try and do. Um, so put simply, if they got hold of foreign Jews, i.e. not Polish, not German, um, those who, ha who had foreign papers, um, one good example of this is actually Mary Bell, who's, who you know, wrote an amazing diary from her experiences in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and, she, and her family held uh, American passports, so she actually qualified as, a, as an exchange Jew through that, through that link anyway. I mean, genuinely had American passports. Um, so that hence why she survived and why she wrote, wrote the, the diary in the memoir that she did. Um, so they were happy to reclassify these, these individuals as exchange Jews with the intention that and at some point they had the possibility, at least, that they could be exchanged for these, as the Nazis put it, valuable Germans abroad. So from a Nazi perspective, from a German perspective, they were exchanging what to them was worthless, which was European Jewry. Uh, and they were exchanging those people for what for them was valuable, which was Germans abroad, right? So that was the logic from a German perspective. And they were willing, in the, in the wrangling over this, um, which goes on mainly between the German Foreign Office and the SS. And you can imagine that the SS was much more um, particular about, about how this should run um, and was much, much keener, really, on extermination rather than sort of dabbling with this sort of thing. But the Foreign Office, being slightly more rationally minded, um, was keen to give this a go and see if it would work so that they could get those German um, individuals back again and repatriate. Um, but in the discussions between the two, it was said that they reckon they could they could probably get um, about 30,000 exchange Jews from from you know having this program running throughout occupied Europe. Um, so quite a substantial number. Um, crucially, if you if you were one of those like Heinz Liechtenstein and others that had one of these passports, and as I said, if you've been able to sort of present it to the right person and get pulled out of the ghetto, pulled out of deportation line, out of a transport. It didn't necessarily mean that you got to leave Europe. It didn't mean that you avoided the Holocaust. It just essentially gave the recipient the chance of survival. It meant, again, to put it crudely, you'd be pulled out of the mechanism of the, of the extermination camps and put into the mechanism of the concentration camps, which sometimes wasn't necessarily um, you know, a much better solution, except that you, you had at least the chance of survival. Um, so you, you got sent, most of them, as I said before, got sent to Bergen-Belsen um, in central Germany rather than Auschwitz-Birkenau or Treblinka, where in most cases, certain death, it was the only thing that awaited them. But at least in Belsen, they had the, the opportunity to, to try and survive and do their best to survive. And they were reasonably... Again, one has to say in inverted commas, reasonably well treated. So for a lot of that period, up until the end of 1944, um, they were sort of, you know, generally um, protected from from the most egregious sort of work details and so on. Um, they would, they would, they had the, the the most comfortable regime within Belsen. There are various sort of sub camps within Belsen. I must explain, um, and some of them had much more rigorous sort of camp discipline in terms of how people were treated and so on. And actually, the exchange Jews had one of the most relaxed for much of that period, up until 1944. And then at the end of 1944, everything uh, in Belsen falls apart anyway. And that's the stage at which, you know, uh, many of them uh, um, uh, don't ultimately survive. But this does give those, let's say, 10,000 individuals at least the opportunity of survival. Key thing. But then we have to say at the bottom, as it says at the bottom there, only 850 plus. This is the number that we know now 
through the various researches, the research I've done, also the Paletsky Institute in, um, in Warsaw did a lot of research on this, um, trawling the archives for, for any names that they can find to put these, put these, uh, uh, the, the names to these 10,000 recipients. We only know about 850 plus, I think the current figure is about 856, who are those that we know survived, that actually survived the Holocaust. So the first thing we have to ask is essentially what went wrong. Um, next slide, please, Alan. Now, of course, we have to um, appreciate that the key thing that went wrong is that, um, you know, Nazi Germany had a project for the extermination um, of all Jews in Europe. So uh, that was essentially, you know, that was the primary responsibility for what went wrong. Um, but a lesser responsibility, particularly in, in, the, in, the, in the particulars of this case, um, lies with this man, Heinrich Rortmund, uh, uh, who was the chief of the Swiss, as they called it, alien police. Um, he was an anti-Semite, as most people seem to um, uh, agree. He was certainly um, the man we know. He represented Switzerland at the Evian Conference in 1938, which is essentially, you know, a conference to uh, uh, make excuses to why nothing, as, as to why nothing was possible um, in in dealing with the um, refugee crisis from Austrian Jews at the time. Um, and it's thought that he was also res responsible for. Um, suggesting to the Germans that they should, you know, reissue Jewish passports with the red J to make them more readily um, uh, recognisable on the frontier, to essentially to uh, to stop them um, creeping in unnoticed into Switzerland and elsewhere. Um, and he was the one who then later um, uh, sort of spearheaded this crackdown on the Wadosh group. Um, using all the efforts and all the all the uh, methods of the Swiss police, um, as I said before, trying to uh, basically pull in the members of the group to intimidate them, to interrogate them, uh, and then subsequently, when that failed, then going after the uh, honorary consuls themselves, which was ultimately successful. Um, his one of his most infamous lines in all of this was that um, in conversation with with uh, uh, Alexander Wadosh, who he'd pulled in for, for interrogation, um, he had it had something of a, a contretemps between them. So Wadosh had basically said, well, this is a humanitarian operation. We're trying to save as many lives as possible. He tried to play the moral card. Um, Rotman wasn't having it. Uh, and he basically said, you can do what you like and just don't do it on Swiss soil, um, which was rather dismissive. Um, Wadosh then accused him of anti-Semitism, which you can imagine didn't go down very well. Um, and the two left uh, or parted on, on, on rather terse uh, and hostile terms. But he was a rather unpleasant individual, as you can imagine. Um, his attitude was one really of, you know, the upholding, at the very least, the upholding of bureaucratic propriety uh, in that very Swiss way, as you can imagine. He, was, he, he found the idea that a serving diplomat would be involved in a scheme to forge passports, uh, almost literally unthinkable. Uh, and it sort of, it, there's incredulity comes across in that uh, exchange with Alexander Wadosh. He just doesn't really understand quite how Wadosh can be doing what he's doing. Um, so really sort of represented um, some rather unpleasant traits, we might say. Another villain of the piece, uh, can I have the next slide, please, Alan? Surprisingly, you might say, um, was actually the U.S. State Department. U.S. State Department was roundly opposed to this plan almost from the outset, as soon as they sort of heard about it. Um, there's a couple of examples here. The problem that they had primarily was that this, this idea of, an, of, an, of a sort of ongoing exchange had already fallen by the wayside. There had been an earlier exchange of um, German citizens abroad held in the U.S., for European Jews, um, and the Americans had been rather unpleasantly surprised by, as they put it, of the, the quality of the individuals that they got back, because they said most of them didn't speak English. You know, they, they had, all right, they had American papers, but they really weren't American citizens. So um, they, they sort of felt like they'd been swindled to some extent uh, by that earlier exchange. So they were sort of resolutely opposed to a future exchange anyway. Nonetheless, the Germans kept collecting up exchange Jews in the hope that they could restart the operation. 
um, but the Americans were rather unmoving. Um, and as you can see, there's a couple of sort of salient points on this uh, slide. Um, their attitude actually to the whole story of the Holocaust took a long time as that got out, because it got out primarily through um, Polish government um, sources and through Polish government information. Um, the State Department initially dismissed news of the Holocaust when it came out in August of 1942, famous Regner telegram, which some of you might know. Um, it was dismissed as a wild rumour inspired by Jewish fears. And this was August 42. Um, so the Holocaust is well underway by that stage, but the Americans are still effectively denying that it's going on. Um, in April 43, as you can see, the US consul in Bern, his name was John Madon, um, actually prompted Rortmund, the man we were just talking about on the previous slide, he prompted Rortmund to clamp down on the Wadish group and to, and to end this passport operation because the simple reason that from the American point of view, this was illegal. And you shouldn't allow them to, to uh, profit from illegal, illegal activity. So, again, well, I don't know quite where John Madon's moral compass was at, but it certainly wasn't in the right place in April 1943. Um, fast forward to September 43, and the State Department there is informing the Germans via the Swiss that Jews holding false papers would not be considered eligible for exchange. So the key thing with this this whole scheme is that you can provide these passports and those those people receiving the passports can be sent to Belsen by the Germans, reclassified as exchange Jews. But if they're actually going to survive the war, they need to have those passports recognized by the outside world. And here are the Americans in September 43, essentially saying, we're not going to recognize these passports. And worse than that, they were going to tell anyone that would listen that they shouldn't recognize the passports either. So they were in the ear of the Paraguayans, for example, and about 70% of the passports that were produced were Paraguayan. And they were in the ear of the Paraguayans saying, you know, it's really not a good idea to, to, to say you'll recognize these passports. And it was never the question that all of those people would end up in Paraguay. And that was made clear. But from a germ, from a, a, the Americans were saying, well, this is, you know, possibly just a vehicle for espionage. And the bottom line, as we said before, is that they, you shouldn't allow um, th these people, i.e. the recipients of these passports, desperate people, but they shouldn't be allowed to benefit from illegal activity. So again, there's, a, there's something morally wrong in that response. Again, March 44, fast forward, and this is a quote from a report from a State Department uh, uh, employee who says, this government's view, US government, US government's view regarding the issuance of fraudulent documents has not changed. It is an oversimplification. This is March 44. It is an oversimplification to say that several hundreds or thousands of Jewish refugees will be killed if South American passports are not supplied to them. We should not be forced and we should not willingly accept a proposal which is essentially fraudulent and improper. March 1944, really quite astonishing. So, of course, as I said, the Americans are in the ear of anyone that will listen, particularly the Paraguayans, to say, really not a good idea to recognize those passports. So, of course, what do the Germans do? Next slide, please, Alan. If the Germans know that those holding those passports, the exchange Jews, are not going to be recognized, then those exchange Jews are miraculously converted back to just being Jews. And by 1944 or 1943, in this case, we know what happens to just Jews who are within the German concentration camp system. So in October 1943, as this sort of wrangling is going on in the sort of diplomatic world, um, and incidentally, it was the Polish diplomats or the diplomats of the government, Polish government in exile in London who were most vociferous in trying to argue the opposite case to the Americans and saying, really, we need, you know, we need you to recognize these passports because otherwise these people are going to be killed, right? So actually they were right. And they were very keen to try and press that on anyone that would listen. Unfortunately, the American voice tended to be louder. So October 43, 1800 Polish exchange Jews are sent from Belsen to Auschwitz. November 43, another thousand. Sent to Russia. We know what happens. 
Um, April 44, the Vittel camp. This was another one of the holding camps that they had for exchange Jews. Um, that camp was li liquidated and another thousand exchange Jews, predominantly Polish, are sent to Auschwitz. By the time you get, as I explained before, to the end of this, um, uh, end of 1944, for example, um, Belsen, which was never, a, never a you know luxury destination by any stretch, um, but it was at least comparatively speaking something of a haven for the exchange Jews. But by the end of that period, uh, late 44, early 45, the food supply system in Belsen had basically broken down. Um, disease was rife. Um, there are situations where you have thousands per day dying of dysentery, cholera, whatever it is, as you'll, I'm sure, know. Um, Anne Frank died in Belsen in March 1945 um, of disease. Um, so disease is rife, you know, the death tolls are mounting. Um, the, the prisoners in Belsen of various categories, as I've mentioned, are most of them mal malnourished. Most of them have been, you know, brutalized and, and horrifically treated. Um, so you have this sort of mass death in Belsen by the end of that period, um, in that sort of three, four month period, something like 35,000 uh, Belsen prisoners die of disease, which is a huge amount. Um, the total death toll in Belsen is something like 55,000, which for a, for a regular concentration camp is quite a large amount. Um, more than Sachsenhausen, more than Dachau and, and many others. Um, there was one last transport and actually an exchange took place in January of 45. And this was a, this was only of about 160 individuals from Belsen taken to Switzerland and exchanged for Germans. Um, and this was actually the transport that um, Danny Finkelstein's mother was on as a young girl. Um, so remarkably, she actually survived um, in that way, from, was actually exchanged. The vast majority of those who were classified as exchanged Jews were never exchanged. Um, the, the, the majority of them were killed um, rather than you know, just surviving. So the, you know, the last remnant of those that sort of survived and that we know survived the war survived those sort of dying days of, uh, of Belsen as, as the place of ground horrifically to a halt um, in the spring of 1945. Uh, and they just survived through um, you know, physical robustness um, and you know, luck, but just the ability to survive. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to sort of put some faces to um, the characters involved, and this is this is I mean it's quite fascinating. This is a selection of the of the uh, uh, some index cards that Kaim Ice had that he held um, of the people that had applied to him. So you can see some of them have a sort of numerical code above them. Um, and very often, you know, these are some of them are people who have been successful in that application and some of them are unsuccessful. Um, but it is, this is just to put some faces to some of those 10,000 um, that we talked about and just sort of humanize the story in some way. Um, and it's, you know, it, it does, I think, I, to me, I always find that quite a, a, a moving slide, really. Um, and it does show us, I think, the potential of this scheme. You know, had the Americans got behind it, um, had the Paraguayans been persuaded to uh, come forward and, and say that they will recognize those passports earlier, um, you know, a much greater proportion of those 10,000 could have been saved. Uh, they would have still seen the war out in Belsen, which would have been horrific, and a proportion of them would probably have died. As you can see, there's infants in there and there's young, there's old men in there. So, you know, some of them would probably have died of, of, from that period where Belsen is falling apart, the end of the war. But still a larger proportion of that 10,000 could have survived had the Americans got on board, had they actually seen that here was a genuine attempt to save a large number of lives uh, from the Holocaust. So in a sense, this is a sort of glimpse of, of, of what was lost. So some, you know, as we said, some of those players in the narrative sat on their hands, prevaricated or, you know, worked against this. This gives us a glimpse of what might have been possible um, if the Wadosh group had been supported uh, in trying to do the right thing. 
the last slide, please, Alan. So we go back to that one. Um, I hope you find that of interest. There's the story of this. I've, I've sort of rattled through it a bit today. There's there's much more detail in the book. There's it's, there's a tremendous human element to the book um, as well. It's a very very human story, even though there is um, all the horror that one might imagine because it is fundamentally a Holocaust story. But as I said at the beginning, there is still this sort of a rather uplifting element to it that we are dealing with a group of people who, who are trying desperately to do the right thing in those desperate circumstances. And to a large extent, they managed to uh, certainly enable a group of people to survive, even if it is only 800 plus. I suspect it's many more. Um, interestingly, I mean, because this story kind of got sunk and got forgotten for so long, I think there are probably more people out there like Danny Finkelstein, I mentioned at the beginning, who have in their sort of family history um, a big question mark around, you know, a Paraguayan passport or a Costa Rican passport or whatever it was, probably Paraguay. And they've never really either asked the question or had certainly not had the question answered as to what role that passport played in the survival of their forebears. That certainly was the case with Danny Finkelstein. So he had this Paraguayan passport, never knew where it came from, never knew the story behind it um, until I told him in, in 2020. Um, I suspect that that story is replicated over and over again, in particularly in the Jewish diaspora, you know, in the US and elsewhere, um, but elsewhere as well. And I think um, um, it's my hope. I mean, it really, I suppose, an expectation, but certainly a hope um, that there will be other people that will come forward and say, that's my story. You know, we had one of those. Uh, my grandfather survived because of one of those. You know, I really hope that that will be the case. And I do expect that to be the case. Um, it would just take time for the for the for this story to sort of trickle down for people to get it and, and understand what how it might fit into their own lives. Um, so it's a, it was a, on that basis, it was a, actually a tremendous honor to, to be able to write this story. Um, there is a genuine feeling, I think, that, you know, you are contributing something to people's lives and to people's understanding of their own lives, which I think is a, a tremendous honor to be able to do that. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I would happily answer. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you. That was a really fascinating presentation. Uh, as Roger just said, if you do have questions, please Put them into the Q&A in the few minutes we've got left. Um, Roger, why why do you think it's taken so long for this story to be told, but particularly given the scale of how many people, uh, you know, or e even even if in the scheme of things, the number mm. of people rescued was was small, it's still a significant number of people. Yeah, yeah. Two things. The first thing is that the um, diplomats who actually were involved doing it, so there were those, as I mentioned, the... Um, the four Polish diplomats and the two Jewish activists. So Chaim Ice didn't survive the war. He died in 1943, natural causes. Um, he's already quite an old man. Um, Abraham Silvershein died soon after the war, again, of natural causes. Um, and the four um, diplomats essentially were scattered to the four winds. You know, they, they, they declined to work for the communists who were incoming in 46, 47. Um, so were relieved of their diplomatic duties and went off to, you know, to, the, you know, to America, to Canada. Um, Renievich went to South America and so on um, and got on with their lives and didn't talk about what they what they'd done. And they and they died in essentially in, uh, you know, with the world in ignorance of what they'd actually done. Um, and also on the other side. So those people that received the passports, the vast majority of them, I see 99 point something percent of recipients never actually knew where the where the passport had come from. So they had written a letter, as I described earlier on very briefly, they had written a letter off to Switzerland to some address that they probably couldn't even remember. Um, and by chance, they'd landed on the right desk, they'd got through that vetting procedure and they'd received a passport back again three months later. Um, they never knew that it came from the Wadosh group or from Polish diplomats in Switzerland. They just They just had written off to to um, Polish aid organizations in, in Berlin. So they didn't know either. 
So even if you had one of those passports and you survived the war and you wrote memoirs and all the rest of it, um, you didn't know where, the, where it had ever come from. It was just a mysterious Paraguayan passport. So for those two reasons, essentially the story got buried uh, until you know it was it was uncovered by by sleuthing in the uh, in the twenty tens, uh, and then it came to me. So I mean it, it it's 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 actually quite uplifting as a historian to to realise that there are these stories still there buried. Mm. Um, you know, we haven't told every story possible. There's, there's still stuff and significant stuff to be found. Has there been any comment from the Americans or, or indeed the Paraguayans as to their behaviour with regard to this? No, no. Um, it would be nice, wouldn't it, to to sort of have that um, have that possibility for uh, redress and con contrition in, to some extent but um, but no, no I don't think either has responded um, there is a sort of ongoing application with Yad Vashem for example for Wadosh Andrinievich to be granted right the title of righteous mm. um, which is which is ongoing and Yad Vashem takes its time uh, and they have they have granted the righteous title to Rokitsky um, who is the one who's actually his handwriting is actually on all of the passports. Um, what's slightly baffling to people like me is is how they would recognize Rokitsky and not the other two, because they're essentially working under the same conditions. Mm. Uh, so there's no greater risk to Rokitsky that wasn't there for the other two. They're all they're all professional diplomats. Um, they're all very fully engaged with the program. So, I, I, you know, I find that slightly baffling, but I'm hopeful that that um, is just a you know a, a misunderstanding or an oversight, and that ultimately they will all be, um, all three of them will be recognised. Those the, those are the three you know Gentile members of the group. So, um, but hopefully that will be recognised, um, which will be a you know a small win for for those that are trying to been trying to publicise this story. We have a question from uh, Irene, who's uh, watched the presentation. Uh, she imagines there were very few people who would have been able to pay such a large amount for mm. a passport. And... Yeah, that's a good a good point, Irene, where the money came from. Um, it didn't come from the individuals themselves. So the you had sort of, a again, it's explained in the book, I had 40 minutes or so, so I had to cut some corners. Um, but, you know, you had all these people writing their letters in desperation, um, and the funding basically came from initially from the Polish government in exile. So the first batch of passports were actually sort of paid for by the by the embassy itself. And then later on, when the and they were actually working to a large extent in isolation, they didn't tell the government in exile what they were doing. And it's quite a funny um, exchange in 1943, where the government in exile in London writes to Wadosh and says, um, oh, there are rumours, like from Jewish circles, there are rumours that there's some um, scheme by which, you know, that people with Paraguay or Latin American passports can, you know, be recategorised as exchange Jews or whatever. Um, and is this something you can get involved with? And you can imagine Wadosh kind of going, uh, hang on, I've been, you know, this is what I've been doing for the last two years. You know, you're, you're telling me my own scheme. Um, but it shows you that he hadn't actually told London at all. Um, and rather gratifyingly when he did say well basically this is what i've been doing for two years they kind of the reaction was you know oh great okay let's let's get behind it let's you know we can provide funding and all this sort of thing um so the Amer the um polish government in exile did supply then a lion's share of the funding but in that initial phase um it was from you know via those aid agencies that had the connections you know, into sort of New York and to the wider sort of Jewish diaspora and the Jewish aid organizations there, you know, World Jewish Congress and all that sort of thing. Um, so they would get the funding from from those organizations, which then would be fun funneled in to, to pay for the passport. So the individuals themselves, the recipients themselves, did not pay for the passports. It came from the aid agencies and then later from the Polish government in exile. Mm. So you've written uh, many books uh, on uh, German and Polish history. What, what's next? Have we got something uh, exciting to look forward to? Uh, a, a slight departure, actually. Um, I've done, as you said, I've done sort of various things. And I've, I've sort of, um, one of the great benefits, really, luxuries of being freelance is that I, I can sort of jump around and I can take on projects like this one. Um, that I just find really interesting um, 
and I get the sort of fascination of researching something very new. Um, so I've done various things. I've, I've you know, I did Berlin at War. I did the book about these uh, assassination attempts on Hitler. Um, I did that, the one you mentioned on uh, First to Fight, which was about the um, uh, Polish, uh, Polish campaign in 39. I did a book about the Nazi Soviet pact. So I, I kind of can jump around quite a lot. And I'm currently doing a book about the U-boat war. Um, but very specifically with a German kind of bent. So it's looking at it from a German perspective. Um, so where where the U-boat war is conventionally told, it's told from the perspective largely of, you know, the, of the convoys and from the destroyers and so on. Um, and the U-boats are generally, you know, literally and metaphorically unseen. Um, so my plan with that book was to kind of turn that on its head and try and tell the story of the U-boat war from the perspective of the U-boat. So it's almost like Das Boot, if anyone remembers Das Boot, the sort of the um the series and the film from the 1980s, um, which followed the story of U-96. Um, it's kind of the Das Boot, the history book. So there's lots of material from you know U-boat veterans um and and the various sort of you know um interrogation um uh, records and so on. Um, about what they experienced and what they thought they were doing and, you know, the, the various difficulties that they encountered and how horrible it was to be on a U-boat for eight weeks. Um, and it was thoroughly horrible. Um, so that's the next one, which I'm, I'm almost, I've got to finish that by the end of the year. And then it should be, it, it will be out in 26. Uh, and then I'll move on to something else. And that, as I said, that's the, the great luxury of being, being freelance. One of our viewers is interested to know if you are multilingual. Uh, yes, I am multilingual. Um, I lived in Germany uh, in the 90s. I have I have fluent German. Uh, I have bad French um, and I have bad Polish. Um, so for Polish, I do have a very, a very brilliant um, research assistant uh, in Warsaw who helped me with this one and helped me with the previous book. Um, so I can't take any credit for that. Um, but I do have Polish. So I do. I do. I do have German. Excuse me. Um, so I do the, the German side of it myself. Fascinating. Well, thank you for being our guest. Uh, this is a, an amazing book available from all good booksellers. And there's a there's a huge amount uh, of, of additional information to that which you have heard. And to say thank you, I'll send you a book of some of my photographs of, of artists from Jerusalem, which I hope you will enjoy uh, reading. Now, just a few words about our upcoming programme before we leave you. Next week, um, we welcome Rachel Cockerell, who will be speaking to me about her book Melting Pot, which is a, a rather uniquely written family history. That should be very interesting indeed. And then on the 16th of September, Milim regular Yankee Fachler is back. This time he's speaking about the dogfight over Sinai, the day Israeli Spitfires shot down five RAF Spitfires. And we have much more in the pipeline to book tickets and for details about other future events, as well as to see the recordings of past events, including this one. Please visit millim.org.uk and you can sign up to our newsletter there to make sure you don't miss anything. All online events are free, but you can make a small donation to help with the cost of us staging these events. There's a link in the chat and also on the website. So it remains for me to thank our guest, Roger Morehouse. Once again, thank you so much for being our guest, Roger. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all next time. Until then, stay safe. See you soon.